Most of us think of ourselves as either male or female. But every year in Britain, around one in 4,000 babies born defy the normal definition of boy or girl. With anatomical features of both sexes, doctors define them as intersex. I don't think of myself as girl, really. I think of myself as more female than male, but um, no, I wouldn't say oh, I'm a female. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lucy. I'm half girl and half boy. That's good. So I'm squashed together. Hmm. I'm cutting half and squashed together. Which half of you is a boy? Mm-hmm. In. And which half of you is a girl? Out. <laughs> Intersexuality, or hermaphroditism as it was once known, has long been cloaked in secrecy and taboo. Where are all the other cups? Recently, however, intersex people have begun speaking out, and a passionate debate has emerged about how intersexuality should be treated by doctors and be seen by the wider world. In this film, we follow three families with intersex children as they face the dilemmas of growing up as neither male nor female, but somewhere in between. Do you ever imagine what it would have been like to have been born a boy? Um. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, but then I also imagine what it'd be like to be born a girl or a person with another form of intersexuality. Um, and I believe most people do as well. Obviously not the intersexuality bit because they probably don't understand it as much. I've told her that there are boys and there are girls and there are interns. It's just another gender that you won't have babies, I don't have babies, I can make babies, and mummy can have babies, but Elizana can't have babies, and Xenia can't have babies. At birth, Ilizana appeared a normal baby girl, but nine months later, her parents discovered she had complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, or AIS, a rare intersex condition, wherein her body is unable to respond to the male hormone testosterone. She had a hernia, inguinal hernia, which we later found out is the most common way that AIS first presents itself and she was in a lot of pain, um, so I had to take her to hospital. See, now that was terrible. She went in for the operation and she came out again and the mother said, uh, the surgeon's been round, there's a problem. <laughs> to start off with, I knew that she had ambiguous gonads, as they called it, um, that actually she had testicles. There was worry about what might happen. Was she going to grow a beard at adolescence? Because with some conditions, she could grow a beard at adolescence. So yes, there was a, the kind of concern, but also a kind of elation, a sort of interest in it, because <laughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> Instead of having female XX chromosomes, Elisana has male XY chromosomes and should be a boy. In the womb, her body was flooded with testosterone, telling her to become male. Yet because she's unable to respond to testosterone, she developed along default female lines. Outwardly, girls with AIS look female, 
and most have a vagina. But inside, where their reproductive organs should be, they have testes. Where the ovaries are basically are testes. There is no penis, there's obviously no external testes, there's also no uterus. Um, there are, there is limited secondary sexual development. You have breasts, but no axial hair, um, because of course that being on the sort of male side, as it were, being a male hormone, because she's insensitive, obviously doesn't doesn't work. Doctors traditionally advised parents to keep a diagnosis of intersexuality secret from their children. Unusually, Elizana's family were determined to be open from the beginning. When did you first become aware that you were intersex? I've been brought up knowing it. There hasn't really been a, a time when I've suddenly realised, oh, OK, I'm, I am different, because <laughs> I've always known it's just been who I am and stuff like that. When she went to school, we primed the teachers. If she says that, actually, I'm neither boy nor girl, I'm intersex or whatever, because uh, she's quite proud of it, if she says that, then she, sh she should be reinforced in that. You know, uh, we didn't want teachers going around saying, oh, don't talk such nonsense. Doctors recommended that Ilizana have her testes removed, partly because of a risk of cancer in later life, but also to help reinforce her female identity. But the dilemma for her is that her testicles produce oestrogen as well as testosterone, and without them, she'd have to take replacement female hormones. Somewhere along the line, she will have to make a decision about her testes. They're not a dilemma in terms of identity or anything like that. They are part of who she is. The only reason to take them out would be for medical reasons to do with cancer risk. There isn't really an increase in the risk of cancer until a bit later in life. And so I can't see any reason to take them out at the moment. It'd just be you know, an operation that's pointless and it means that I'd be on um, hormone replacement therapy for the rest of my life. And that's just something that I just don't want to be bothered with. Tell me the window. I'm sure I still remember how to. AIS is an inherited condition passed along the maternal line. When, with her new partner Neil, Nancy became pregnant with Xenia, there was a one in four chance that she too would be intersex. I have some kisses as well. When I was pregnant, they offered to do various tests so that they could find out if my child had AIS. And I asked, you know, why? And naturally, it's because if my child had AIS, they could abort. But would they so, really have offered to, to abort? abort? Oh, yes, most certainly. Um, so I declined the test because I was quite happy having the AS child. When I first found out about it, but I remember feeling quite excited, you know, wow, there's another one like me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I thought it was quite good. When I was born, the doctors didn't know whether I was male or female. I had a part of a testo, and, but I had no penis. So they thought I were a boy, and told my mum that I didn't have a penis. A couple of days later, I says, no, you haven't, you've got a girl. Because they did some tests and found that got part of an ovary.
Louise was born with true hermaphroditism, an extremely rare intersex condition, defined by doctors as having part testy, part ovary inside. At birth, her genitalia were so underdeveloped, she appeared neither male nor female. But because at that time it was easier for surgeons to create a girl rather than a boy, a fold of skin was fashioned to resemble a vagina. Her ovary and testy were cut out, and doctors advised her mother to raise Louise as female. They said it would be better to bring him up as a, a girl. They said it'd be ideal because I'd got two girls already at home. They said they didn't have to tell anybody. I mean, although by the fact by then we'd already announced in the local paper that we'd had a boy. <laughs> and they said, you know, the only people that really needed to know was herself and the doctor. When I was born, it was the doctors told my mother to keep it hush hush, don't tell anybody. Just me, you and the, me, you and the doctors have to know that's it. In fact, if you can, try and keep it from Louise. When Louise was born, doctors believed that nurture outweighed nature in determining a child's inbuilt sense of whether they're male or female. By raising Louise as a girl, the theory was that she would behave like a girl, and she need never know of her condition. She didn't play with any girl things at all. It was always boys' things. I bought her boys' toys. I mean, ex-husband didn't like that at all. You know, he said I should be buying it girls' toys, but she weren't going to play with them. We no good buying them. Um, I mean, her favourite toy were a tractor and trailer, and she'd set that everywhere. I knew that wasn't normal because I spent a lot of time in hospital. I looked different, felt a bit different as well to what, how I should be feeling. Most girls play with dolls and that, but I didn't want to, I wanted to play with cars and stuff like that. Why the interest in train spotting? No train photography. I must correct you, I don't, I don't do train spotting. I do train photography, it's different. I think it stems from when I was a child and used to have to go out of London a lot to Great Home Street Hospital. I used to go down by train and I think it's come from that sort of things, really. In addition to being intersex, Louise has a string associated with medical conditions. Spending much of her childhood in hospital and confused over her gender, her behaviour became more and more disruptive. I used to do anything to get attention for myself. I also used to get picked on a lot as well, so like, I used to try and do anything I could to try and win friends over, really. Because I felt so lonely and low, and the aggression was a form of release. It was like a volcano going whoosh, and all the anger just getting released all at one go. Who did you take it out on? I took it out on my mum. She'd bring a knife out to me, you know, cut furniture up and she'd keep toes indoors and... In fact, I found a photograph. That sort of thing that she used to do to me, see me eye. How did that happen? She'd head buttered me. just found that last night and I thought, oh, I'll keep that out and I'll show you. Sort of things you used to do to me.
In her teens, Louise was given female hormones to induce a puberty of sorts, and it became harder and harder for Anne to hide her daughter's intersex condition from her. Even when she first got a computer, and she brought this letter down, she says, yeah, I want you to read this and don't show it anybody else. Mum, typing this is so hard, so please do not take it the wrong way or lightly. Mum, I want to ask you something. Did you know I would end up like this, with all these problems? If so, why did you keep me alive for me to go through all the pain and upset? I have hardly any friends, I'm not likely to get a job, and if I do, I'll not be able to keep it. Well, I be honest. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives... A lot of the time I think you lied to me. Please tell me what you know about everything about me and my problems because I want to know what to expect in the rest of my life. Yours lovingly, Louise Thompson, your loving daughter. Yeah, folks, uh, I pray the Lord call me to preach. I just didn't know what to say to her. Um, that, uh, well, all her life, I, I didn't want her asking questions because I just didn't know what to say. Um, and, and she knows that. I've always loved her, um, but uh, it's very difficult when, when you know you don't know what to say, and because you, you really haven't talked about it to anybody. So you know, I couldn't talk to her because I couldn't tell her anything. She was one of the doctors when he was checking the newborn. They called me on one side and said there was a problem. She had a large clitoris and it wasn't, the vagina was actually closed. Was there any question as to whether Bianca was a boy or a girl? Yes. Uh, as I say, they, they weren't quite sure uh, if she had the ovaries. Bianca has an inherited intersex condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH. In contrast to girls with AIS, her chromosomes are female, and she has a womb and ovaries. But a failure of her adrenal gland before she was born meant that her body produced damaging levels of testosterone. As a result, her vagina didn't fully form, and her clitoris began developing into a small penis. I had uh, four uh, normal children. Bianca was different, being a different father. If the same 40 genes get together, they just produce completely, you know, two 40 genes produce a 40 gene, obviously. That's what happens in um, Bianca's case. So it's one in 10,000. So it's a very rare condition to happen. So unfortunately, they even asked me if we were cousins, if we were related. But no, obviously. <laughs> I'm Portuguese and he's English. Until very recently, surgeons would routinely cut off or reduce the enlarged clitoris of a baby girl with CAH. But there's been a furious backlash from intersex adults who claim that what was in effect cosmetic surgery has ruined their sex lives. The dilemma for Bianca's mother and her doctors is how aggressive they should be in treating her condition. 
the operation is only going to, going to be like to restore the vaginal area. So they're going to leave the clitoris as it is because they, they made a research all over the world saying that the women wouldn't feel any pleasure sexually. So they, they, they decided they're going to leave that. Mm -hmm. Intersex activists argue that even limited surgery isn't usually necessary until CAH girls reach puberty. And despite most parents' natural desire for a normal girl, Hello. many are doctors you? are now wary of early surgical intervention. She was born at a stage when anti-early surgical opinion was probably at its height. Bianca, I think, must have been one of the first um, patients with CAH where we seriously sat down and discussed with mother the concept of not operating to feminize her genitalia. As we wanted to do. Quiet you. Stop making a racket. I think this was extremely traumatic for Bianca's mum. Of course, Bianca would have to look like a little girl because she was a little girl. The other side of it is the, um, the appearance of the external genitalia, that we are going to sort of correct that so as we will make it as normal looking. It's going to be for the best that she's going to have this operation, and the sooner the better, really. Um, so she'll um, grow up as normal. Um, so I'm quite... Uh, in, in that, I'm quite positive and quite happy that it's going to happen now. Where you on the scales? There we go. Ultimately, we really made the decision here to go ahead and to offer feminizing surgery. Okay, she's one, 102, so she's 736 kilos. We felt it would be almost impossible for her to be reared in a happy family environment if this surgery did not take place. Lilia and the doctors have agreed a compromise. Bianca's clitoris won't be cut, but concealed within her reconstructed vagina. And when she's older, she will be able to decide whether to have further surgery. However, since Bianca is one of the very first children in Britain to have this new procedure, its long-term results are unknown. Do you want a record blanket? Yes. Yeah? It, well, we're going to take her down now? Yes, they phoned for us to go down, so... Uh... The high levels of testosterone that coursed through Bianca's body while she was in the womb have fused her labia and joined her urethra to her vagina. If you can see here, this is her bladder and that behind is her vagina and that's the urethra, the tube that she's draining through and both of these join to form a common channel. So one of the main parts of the operation today is to separate that those two, so as um, she'll end up with two openings down below, as well as making the anatomy look more normal as well. Bianca Ford. Come in, my love. Don't. No. Where's the release, mate? These are gentle loops. <laughs> Two and a half times magnification, good depth of field, good breath. You can see everything in the periphery. Going back certainly to the late 70s and the early 80s was a condition that was shrouded in secrecy. The tendency was to offer surgical treatment in early infancy with the expressed intention being that the diagnosis of whatever intersex problem it was would not be disclosed. 
And the child would be reared very firmly in the assigned gender. The condition would not be divulged, usually to even close relatives, and certainly probably not to the child, even when they got older. And from what David was saying, he's now recommending a like that? Yeah. It certainly is true that the initial approaches were philosophical and ideological rather than being based on evidence. But we are completely lacking in evidence to show that the delayed approach is going to be any better. And in fact, we don't even know whether the delayed approach might even be worse in the long term. So in a way, we are um, practicing blindly at the present time. I don't know, just that's, that's pin sticky on it because she's waiting. Hello, sweetheart. Good girl. Like her half-sister Irizana, Xenia has androgen insensitivity syndrome, or AIS. Though outwardly girls, they have male chromosomes and testes where their ovaries should be. While doctors understand the physical side of their condition, much less is known about how being intersex affects a child's behavior and innate sense of gender. If I'm looking, then I'd probably see a mixture. And probably I see less of a mixture in Xenia because her outer persona is more feminine or her interest in pretty things is more feminine. She seems to me quite girly. She likes sort of girly things. Some of her behaviour can be quite boyish, yes. It would be interesting to see what happens at puberty. I'm really into karate and break dancing, and those are probably seen as quite masculine things. I do see a maleness about me. <laughs> I felt that when you were going through puberty, you did display certain grunting characteristics, <laughs> which I've always associated with boys. But you also have a strong female side. I think you have the sort of best of both mm -hmm. worlds. It doesn't matter to me if they see themselves as super women or girls with AIS or as intersexual beings. I'm happy to go along with whatever makes them feel comfortable about themselves. And if in order to feel comfortable about themselves they feel the need to instruct society at large that there is a neutral gender, that's fine as well. And what was Sleepy Sammy? Usually when I meet someone, I'll start talking to them and everything, and I'll get to know them, and I'll let them get to know me, and then I'll tell them that actually I'm not as I seem. I'm actually an intersexual.
usually they're sort of like fairly curious about what it all is and what it means and and um but yeah usually shock comes in there somewhere as well we live in a society that has these two opposites male and female it's a lie there's a whole plethora of gradations Daddy, one of the big boys said that's an illness. Hmm, I'm sure he did. And is it? No, I don't think it is. Do you feel ill? No. Then no, it's not an illness. If you were ill, if you felt ill, or there was something making you ill, or something stopping you being able to function like well, this. Well, my ears. Yes, you've got... Your ears they don't are work much. That is right, me. But that's not because you're an inter. <laughs> In contrast to Ilizana and Zania, Louise spent most of her childhood not knowing of her true condition. Only recently has Anne allowed her daughter to see her medical notes for herself. Yeah, the first, what they put as final diagnosis, which was on the 7th of May 1977, was intersect penile agenesis plus ectopic urethral orifices in in our rectum. <coughs> Were there things in there that you didn't know? A lot. A lot. Well, what'd you add and Eve it? This girl is 46, XY chromosome complement. What's that mean, Louise? I've got no idea. But I've just discovered that it does actually give my chromosome a makeup. XY in normal circumstances is uh, a boy. Hmm. Do you think it was the right decision to raise Louise as a girl? No. 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 And I shouldn't be saying that really. But, um, no, to be truthful, I don't think I've made the right decision now. But Louise, you think it probably was the right decision? I, th I think it was, yes. Could you imagine? life as a male? Not fully. Not fully. I don't, I don't think it's possible to do that. Being raised a female, I couldn't really say what I'd be like being raised with a male. Five and two, fifty-two. Eight and four, eighty-four. Seven and three. Seven. So I think it'd be a bit unfair to say whether it was right or wrong. But what I do think is that it shouldn't be done. Children should be given the choice when they get older whether they should be brought up as male or female. Eight and five, eighty-five. Five and nine, fifty-nine. Eight and nine, eighty-nine. She'd be about sixteen. She was still, you know, boyish. I just asked her, you know, she'd like to sort of be reversed back, you know, to a boy. Um, I'm quite willing, you know, to go with her and we'd, we'd move away where somebody didn't, you know, where people didn't know us and, you know, we could start again, but she didn't want to do it, did you? I did think about it for a while, but thought no. Item number one, 
Three, five, thirty-five. Claim on thirty-five. Nine months after surgery to restore her vagina, Lilia has brought Bianca to live in their native Madeira. She recovered very well and the surgery was a success, so I was very pleased and she recovered really fast. They've done the right thing by doing the surgery now. Um, because now she would grow like, like, I mean, she would get used to what she is. She wouldn't know the difference. What's that? Bianca's condition means that she continues to produce too much testosterone. And to prevent her body masculinizing, she'll be dependent on drugs for the rest of her life. What's that you're putting in Lilia? It's a hermetic cortisone. She doesn't like it. I'm not surprised. No! Okay. Will Bianca's old enough? Will you explain to her about her condition? Yes. Yes, uh, I will. Uh, but um, I'll make sure she wouldn't feel like if she's different and make sure that she understands that it uh, could have been worse, could, be, could have been something really, really worse, really bad, so there's nothing to worry about. Vinka. Despite the apparent success of her operation, when Bianca enters puberty, she'll most likely need further surgery to create a fully functioning vagina. When she's older, she will have another operation, but she will have to decide. It's not going to be up to me to decide. Is that not better then? She can't blame you if you make the wrong decision. Yes, that is true. She can't blame me. But again, she can. I don't know. I mean, children, we, we don't know what's going to happen, what's going to go in their minds. So, one way or the other, they could blame me, I don't know. So I've had doctors and hospitals involved in my life since the day I was born. When I worked it out a couple of years ago, I think I'd had 1.2 operations for every year I've been alive. And it's still continuing? Yeah. Seven years ago, Louise underwent major surgery to construct a vagina, which proved to be unsuccessful. Now she's come to London to discuss with her urologist about having a second operation. You know that at the moment you haven't really got anything that would really pass as a vagina. Mm -hmm. There is some skin there from the previous surgery. Mm -hmm. And the way that we would do this operation uh, is to try and use as much of the skin as you've got mm -hmm. down in the crutch. And we may be able to use some of your bladder. Mm -hmm. One way or another, we should be able to make a vagina. Um, some of the tissues in your crutch will be sexually sensitive, and those are the areas we try our best to preserve. But I really couldn't promise you that the vagina would have real sexual sensation. I couldn't promise you that you'd be able to have an orgasm with mm -hmm. it. Can surgery, if you like, cure an intersex condition? No. It's, it's not a, a curable condition in the present state of our knowledge. And the results of 
complex vaginoplasty in sexual terms are not terribly good. Louise, that's pretty radical surgery. Why go ahead with it? It'll make me feel whole as a person. But at the minute I don't know where I am because there's not a lot I can do. I mean, if I get married, I basically I can't have sex at the minute. So it, I don't really feel whole. At London's Middlesex Hospital, Louise is about to undergo major surgery. It's a second attempt by doctors to construct a vagina for excuse me, again. excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. The operation is complicated by Louise's unique physiology and the mass of scar tissue from previous surgery. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll do a complex vaginoplasty of this sort probably about uh, four or six times a year, but overall it's, it's a very unusual procedure. Louise does have some sexual sensation. Last night in the ward she marked out the skin that she feels is sensitive and it would be very important to use as much of that as we possibly can. Yes. Everything here is rather stuck together, which is a, co a normal consequence of um, previous surgery. There are no shortcuts to this, you just have to pick away at it to the area that you wish to expose. 26 years ago, certainly making a vagina was a lot easier than making a penis. Um, Let's have a couple of counts, please. And another one, please. Now, both can be done. And to be truthful, I mean, there isn't a master plan, as we've seen, right. you've got to make it up as you go right, along. Right, but, yeah, yeah. but if we open that skin in the perineum, yeah. I would have thought it was absolutely certain to become infected. If Louise was born today, would she have been assigned female gender in the same way? I think it's almost impossible to answer that question because her situation is so rare. Um, I think in the light of the knowledge we now have about uh, genital function, we would probably have tried to raise her as a male. Five hours into the operation, doctors run into a major problem. Louise's pelvic bone is masculine in shape. The arch is too narrow and needs to be opened up to accommodate her new vagina. a little tighter than I would like. But I think it's as good as we could have made it. Uh, and um, chiseling away more of the pubic bone I think would have destabilized it and uh, it can make walking a little difficult. That would be my dream for it to have um, a normal life even have a boyfriend and get married. That, that's always been my dream for him. I was forced into the direction where I'm in. One, two, three. One, two, three. But I could have turned around and said, no, I want to change. But no, I want to be a woman. I feel a woman. And I'm going to continue my life as a woman. I want to go the full, the full distance 
and make myself complete as a woman. I don't really think of it as boys and girls, and I don't think I ever have. It's just, you know, the individual and how you react to them. You say you're absolutely open about being intersex. I mean, in terms of boyfriends, how does that complicate things? Does it complicate things? Um... It hasn't have yet. <laughs> um, no, I, I can't see it as a problem because, well, not for me personally. I, I can appreciate that for other people it could be a problem. In, in physiological terms, of course, what it does mean is that you, you can't bear children. At 16, is that something you think about? Not really so much, because I, I've always thought that, you know, if I do want children, then, you know, I can adopt. It won't be quite the same, but, you know, it, it's OK. Tell me about boyfriend you had at school. I was about 14, 15. He was about 17. To everyone else, he might not have appeared the ideal catch, but to me he was. He loved me, I loved him. We got on rather well. We had a lot in common. You had boyfriends since then? Had male friends, but not relationship-wise. I'd like the right man to come along. I mean, we all mind having a bit of fun in the meanwhile. Like most people would. I'm going to go to an art college and do a performing arts course. Otto! Otto! I really like the buzz of standing up in front of people and going, hey, this is me. Or rather, this isn't me, I suppose. But if that falls through, <laughs> then, um, then I want to do genetics. Bit of a change of subject, but but yeah, no, I I really like biology and stuff like that.